the way down over his ears. Some hair is going day, to show. December 8th, he was sentenced in the year 1976. 46 years ago, Virgin Presnell was sentenced to death for the murder. Welcome back to the Death Row and Executions channel. I'm Paco Rivera. In the year 2002, Scott Eisenberg and his wife Roberta had been married about 10 years. By June of that year, in Garden City, Michigan, Roberta Eisenberg decided that she can no longer tolerate her husband's heavy drinking and the physical abuse that he was inflicting on her, which included choking her until she was passed out. Eisenberg was also continually accusing his wife of cheating on him. Roberta told her husband that she was leaving him with their two young children, a boy and a girl. According to Roberta, Scott Eisenberg had made the statement that if she ever tries leaving him, that he will kill all three of them. Roberta managed to flee and filed for divorce. When she returned to the house with a police escort to retrieve her items, she found inside the house rotted ground beef, hamburger meat, molded into what appeared to be human figures as if sending a message that this is what your decomposing bodies will look like. Scott Eisenberg continued stalking and harassing Roberta, so she filed for a restraining order. One day, as he was trying to gain access to where she was now living, police were notified and he was arrested for violating that order. Eisenberg is later released on bail, but he refused to show up for his court hearing, skipped bail, and got out of town. At some point, he got a hold of a bicycle and rode into the town of Depew in Oklahoma, about 950 miles away from where he started in Garden City, Michigan. Once in Depew, he stopped to rest outside the First Methodist Church where an older man, a church member named John Wright, was mowing the church's lawn. Eisenberg, pouring on his charming personality, told John that he was riding his bike cross country to raise money for victims of the 9-11 terrorist attacks that occurred a year earlier. When Eisenberg asked John if he could pitch a tent beside the church, John offered a room in the fellowship hall inside the church where Eisenberg can stay for a short time. Over the following weeks, Scott Eisenberg attended church and met other members, including John Wright's wife, Carla, and their daughter, Catherine Biggs known simply as Kathy. Kathy at the time was married to a man named Mark Biggs who owned a cowboy boots and western wear store. Kathy would later say that she was very unhappy with her marriage to Mark. Kathy also had a son named Tyler Montgomery from a previous marriage. Tyler was living with his grandparents, Kathy's mom and dad, John and Carla Wright. Scott Eisenberg and Kathy's husband, Mark Biggs, actually ended up becoming good friends, and Scott helped out Mark at the Western Wear store sometimes. At some point, Eisenberg left town and returned several weeks later. He pretended to be distraught and told Kathy and Mark Biggs that his wife and children were killed in a car accident and he has nowhere to live. Mark and Kathy Biggs agreed to allow Eisenberg to live with them in Tulsa until he can get back on his feet again. So now we have Kathy living with her husband, who she wasn't happy with, and a man named Scott Eisenberg, who continued pouring on the charm. And sure enough, Scott and Kathy began having an affair. Scott Eisenberg had also convinced Kathy that he was about to receive a million dollar settlement from a lawsuit against a trucking company. This guy had some stories. Scott Eisenberg and Mark Biggs would later sit down for a discussion where Scott told Mark, in so many words, look, she's not happy with you, and Kathy and I are a thing now, so you gotta go. Mark packed his things and moved out. Mark and Kathy later made it official with a divorce. Eisenberg and Kathy remained living together for the next few months until the relationship began souring. And Kathy realized that Eisenberg was a control freak. He told her how she must dress and he told her how she must do her hair as to not attract other men. 
he accused her many times of cheating on him. And on the day that she told him that they needed to break up and he needs to leave the apartment, Eisenberg tied up her wrists, placed duct tape over her mouth, and left her seated like that on the living room couch for hours. During that time, he sometimes held a knife to her throat and told her that she's not breaking up with him, saying it over and over again. When he finally decided to release her, Kathy managed to escape and reported the situation to the Tulsa Police Department. She also obtained a restraining order. Kathy, in fear for her life, grabbed a few things from her apartment and got a nursing job at a hospital in Lawton, Oklahoma, about 125 miles away from Tulsa. In September of 2003, while Kathy was in Lawton, Eisenberg breaks into her Tulsa apartment, which she continued to maintain because the lease hadn't expired yet and she still had much of her stuff there. Eisenberg made himself at home and over the following weeks, in a fit of rage, he proceeded to destroy as much as he could in the apartment and ripped all of Kathy Biggs' pictures and clothing to shreds. He also watched a lot of television, including pay-per-view adult films offered by the cable TV company. When Kathy received a bill from the cable company showing the charges for the adult films, she contacted Tulsa police and informed them that someone has broken into her apartment. She had a pretty good idea who it was. Police arrived at the apartment and arrested Scott Eisenberg for burglarizing the home and violating the restraining order. Eisenberg was released on bail again about a month later, but fails to appear in court again. And on October 17, he hitchhikes from Tulsa back to the Pew, Oklahoma, where Kathy's parents, John and Carla Wright, live with her son, Tyler. Scott Eisenberg had believed that Kathy was also staying at that home. The following day, he made his way to the home of John and Carla Wright and staked it out, watching for Kathy to come home. He wanted a better view of their house from a spot where he can't be seen and chose to break into the house directly across the street while its owners, A.J. Cantrell and his wife, Patsy Cantrell, were out. While inside, he found a collection of hunting rifles and grabbed a shotgun along with some ammunition and he loaded the weapon. He then stood by a window looking at the Wright's home across the street. While Eisenberg had quickly gone to the refrigerator to grab a bite to eat, AJ and Patsy Cantrell arrived home. Eisenberg pointed the shotgun at the elderly couple who were also church members of the Depew church he had attended and who recognized him as Kathy's ex-boyfriend. And they were aware of the breakup. Eisenberg ordered AJ and Patsy to sit on the sofa while he remained at the window looking at the right home watching for Kathy to return to the house. I told her that I was waiting for Kathy to get home and Kathy had done things to me that were wrong and I was going to confront her about it and then hopefully this whole situation, the whole mess would be over. Of course, no one knows exactly what happened next because both AJ and Patsy are dead and Eisenberg is known to be a notorious, pathetic liar. But at some point, Patsy got up and began to walk away. She was shot in the back by Eisenberg. AJ may have engaged in a struggle with Eisenberg, but the much younger, stronger man ended up beating him to death with repeated blows to the head using the butt of the shotgun rifle. Two hours later, Eisenberg got tired of waiting and walked across the street. He gained entry to the Wright's home. Kathy's son, 16-year-old Tyler Montgomery, recognized the threat and tried to run away, but he was shot in the back. Eisenberg then went into the kitchen and used the butt of the shotgun rifle to beat Tyler's grandmother's head with it. Tyler's grandfather, John Wright, was attending a high school football game at the time. Although Tyler was severely injured, he managed to get on his feet and make a run for the family's pickup truck outside to go get help. 
When Eisenberg saw that Tyler was getting away, he ran after him and jumped into the rear bed of the pickup truck with his shotgun. Tyler was swerving the vehicle, trying to knock Eisenberg out of it. Eisenberg managed to reload the shotgun and fired through the rear window and into the back of the driver's seat. The bullet struck Tyler in the upper shoulder. Eisenberg then shot again, but Tyler had moved his head away and ended up getting grazed on the side of the head. Tyler then happened to be reaching the high school field where his grandfather was located along with a gathering for a football game. Tyler decided to crash the pickup truck into a utility pole as hard as he could. When he looked to the back, Eisenberg appeared to be knocked out on the bed of the truck. Tyler Montgomery, barely clinging to life after being shot now three times, stumbled out of the pickup truck and limped onto the field where he was approached by people gathered there, including his grandfather, John Wright. Tyler told John that Scott Eisenberg shot him and beat Grandma back at the house. Carla Wright was unconscious on the kitchen floor and woke up in a pool of blood coming from her head. She managed to get to a phone and called police. After police and paramedics arrived, Carla had suddenly wondered if her dear church friends from across the street were okay, and she asked police to please go check on them. That's when police discovered AJ and Patsy Cantrell dead inside their home. The manhunt for Scott Eisenberg began. A perimeter was established around town, and they searched everywhere. Back at the high school football field, Scott Eisenberg regained consciousness and climbed out of the bed of the pickup truck and fled in the opposite direction into the woods. He knew police would be looking for him. There was a lot of farmland around him, and he came upon a barn. He went inside, and while still holding on to the shotgun, he hid under a stack of bales of hay. He remained under that stack for the next few days, clearly hearing police radio chatter outside and several times. Officers had entered that barn looking for him, but didn't see him. If police had moved some of those bales of hay over, they would have found him. By the fourth day, Eisenberg was starving and thirsty, and taking his chances, he left the barn. He then broke into a house and drank water and ate food from the refrigerator. He also found a handgun in a drawer and ammunition and took that with him. He got rid of the bigger, much heavier shotgun. When the homeowner returned, he reported the burglary. He also told police that he lost the firing pin for that handgun a long time ago. It's broke. It won't work. Police believed it was Eisenberg that burglarized the house and were frustrated at how he was always a step ahead of them. Eisenberg continued hiding in the woods for the next few days until the need for food and water once again became a problem for him. He had to find a way to resolve that. He knew police would still have most of the town surrounded while looking for him. He returned to the First Methodist Church in Depew where everything began. And with nobody around, he went inside and made his way to the food storage pantry where there was plenty of food and water. And he ended up staying in that food pantry, undetected, for about a month. He used a radiator to cook meat from the refrigerators. There was even a small television in there where he was able to follow the news on the search for him. At one point, police decided to do a search of the church and entered the food pantry. Eisenberg had heard them approaching. There was a closet in there and he went inside. He could hear police searching throughout the pantry area, but they never opened the closet door. On November 23rd, 2003, it's now been about five weeks since the manhunt began, 74-year-old Doyce Petrie, a church volunteer, arrived at the church to gather some food for a needy family in town. She spotted a man in the pantry and ran out of there. At some point, she tripped and broke her ankle. Eisenberg noticed car keys for a red 1987 Toyota Corolla that Doyce Petrie was driving, a car that belongs to her daughter. The keys were hanging by the front door. He grabbed the keys and took off in that car. 
Joyce Petrie then went to a church neighbor's home and 911 was called. Police in Oklahoma were now looking for that car. Eisenberg managed to cross the state line out of Oklahoma into Arkansas and the car ran out of gas in Waldron, Arkansas. He gets out, raises the hood on the car, turns on the four-way flashes and hopes for help from a good Samaritan driving by. And that is exactly what happens. Dr. Samuel Peebles and his wife Suzanne were returning to their home in Nashville, Arkansas from a funeral when they spotted the stranded motorist. Sam Peebles offered Scott Eisenberg a ride to the next town. While in the car, Eisenberg borrowed a cell phone from Suzanne and he used it to call his ex-girlfriend, Kathy. Kathy answered the call, but Eisenberg didn't say anything and he ended the call. Making that call was a huge mistake on his part and a big break for authorities who had set up tracking on Kathy's phone in the event that Eisenberg ever tried calling her. Authorities in Arkansas were notified. Police in Arkansas were now looking for Eisenberg. While still in the car, Eisenberg pretended to be talking to someone on the cell phone. When Sam Peebles said he was going to stop for a snack at a convenience store, Eisenberg pulled out his gun and told Sam to just continue driving. That's when Sam's wife, Suzanne, panics. She totally loses it. And not thinking clearly what she was doing, she reached for the gun in Eisenberg's hand, grabs onto it, and tries to yank it away from him. Eisenberg manages to pull the gun away and told the couple that he is already facing death row in Oklahoma and won't hesitate to kill again. Suzanne manages to calm down and her husband continues driving. They end up going from Arkansas into Texas and continued heading south. Eisenberg may have thought about trying to reach the Mexican border. What Eisenberg didn't know was that Dr. Sam Peebles had a gun beside him in the side pocket of the car door but getting to it while driving was going to be difficult. After having driven more than six hours and over 300 miles, Suzanne suddenly blurted out loud, I know he's going to kill us. Soon after that, Sam Peebles insisted that he had to go to the bathroom. Eisenberg at first refused to allow it, but after Sam continued squirming around in his seat and saying that he really had to go, Eisenberg allowed him to pull over onto the side of a dark road. There were no lights on out there. It was very dark. All three got out of the car. Dr. Sam Peebles retrieved his gun and went around to the side of the car where Eisenberg and his wife were standing. He pointed the gun at Eisenberg and shot about eight times. Four shots ended up striking Eisenberg in the chest, but he was still alive. And he approached and attacked Sam Peebles. Sam Peebles' gun went flying out of his hand onto the ground somewhere where nobody can see it. With Sam Peebles on the ground, Eisenberg pointed his gun at Suzanne's head and pulled the trigger. It just clicked. Nothing happened. Remember, that gun wasn't working. He then proceeded to hit Suzanne in the head with it and then walked over to Sam Peebles and struck him several times. Eisenberg then went into the Peebles car and drove off with four gunshot wounds to his body. Sam and Suzanne Peebles got up off the ground. They were hurt, they were injured, but they were relieved and grateful that they are still alive and that the threat for them has ended. They arrived at a nearby home where the owner contacted police. Police in Texas were now looking for Eisenberg. Scott Eisenberg arrived at a store where he got some bandages and other medical products to treat his gunshot wounds, but he had no money. So he showed the store clerk his gun and the clerk told him, take them, they're yours. Afterward, the clerk called police. Police arrived at the store, but Eisenberg was long gone. A police patrol car in Lufkin, Texas eventually spotted the Peebles stolen car and pulled it over. Eisenberg's running had come to an end. Eisenberg was taken to a hospital where he was treated and after recovering he gave an FBI agent a full confession 
and he was later extradited back to Oklahoma to face capital murder charges. At trial, defense lawyers for Scott Eisenberg told the jury that when Patsy Cantrell got up to walk away from the sofa that A.J. Cantrell jumped him and they struggled as A.J. tried to wrestle the gun away from Eisenberg and that is when the gun fired, killing Patsy. The jury believed that to be a possibility and Eisenberg was ultimately convicted of second degree murder for the death of Patsy Cantrell and he received a 150-year sentence. It was for the beating death of A.J. Cantrell that Scott Eisenberg was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Thankfully, both Tyler Montgomery and his grandmother, Carla Wright, recovered from their wounds, though both say that they still have lingering after-effects from those injuries. However, they lived to testify against the man who killed their neighbors, across the street from their home. Before that tragic day, A.J. and Patsy Cantrell had only recently celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. If you would like to see more of these death row stories, please subscribe so that you are alerted when the next one comes out. I'm Paco Rivera. Bye for now.